Thank you so much for tuning in. My name is Cassie Riva. I'm the events coordinator at an unlikely story bookstore in Plainville, Massachusetts. Before we start, here's a couple technical tips for you. Questions for the authors can be written in the question and answer box at the bottom of your screen or in the chat. If you'd like to buy Olivia, Olivia Abtai's or Kate Reculia's books, click the green button at the bottom of your screen and it'll take you to our website. I am so delighted to introduce debut author Olivia Abtai tonight. Olivia is a film director and writer based in Denver, Colorado, and holds a BFA from NYU School for Film and Television, as well as a master's in advertising from VCU Brand Center. When she isn't drafting novels about awkward teens, you can find her working on documentaries about social justice and climate change. Olivia's debut young adult novel, Perfectly Parveen, is a funny romp about frizzy-haired bassoon player Parveen, who tries to turn the eye of high school heartthrob Maddie by pretending to be like the woman in her favorite rom-coms. But between the parent-mandated Farsi lessons and the ramifications of the Muslim ban on her family in Iran, Parveen soon realizes that being herself is more important than ever. If you're fans of Netflix's Never Have I Ever, is gonna, you're gonna love this book. It's so funny, I've been laughing all morning, it's so good. And according to Olivia's senior year bassoon teacher, she was the worst first chair bassoonist in Northern Virginia. Joining Olivia tonight is award-winning author Kate Reculia. Kate is the author of the novels This Must Be the Place and Bellwether Rhapsody, which was the winner of the American Library Association's Alex Award. She received her MFA from Emerson College and now works for the Bethlehem Area Public Library in Pennsylvania. We hosted her about a year ago for the paperback release of her novel Tuesday Mooney Talks to Ghost, which was a Kirkus Reviews Best Book of 2019, an October 2019 Indie Next pick, and a BuzzFeed Best Paperback of October 2020. Kate was also a bassoon player, and I think her bassoon will be making a cameo in tonight's event. I've never seen one in real life, so I'm really excited. Olivia, Kate, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Hi. Hi. Hey there. Hello. Hi, Olivia. How are you? Hi, Kate. I'm so excited about this bassoon cameo. It's like the highlight of my week, honestly. <laughs> I mean, honestly, same. Honestly, same. And we're going to build some some suspense, some tension. <laughs> Do you want to Oh. <laughs> I see what you did there. I see what you did there. Um, so I do you want to start by reading your 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 um section? Your yes. Verse, like by I've got a little excerpt here. Um and just for some context, uh the book is instead of chapters, there's like little like timestamps. Um so we're starting this book, uh this little excerpt uh Friday at the James K. Polk High Orientation at 5 p.m. <laughs> All right. To say I had anxiety about starting high school was an understatement, but freshman year orientation night was supposed to help with that. Right when it felt like we'd gotten the hang of middle school, we were punted off to a building five times its size and made to start all over again. At least Fabian and Ruth were starting with me, and I'd get to see Wesley after being apart for a couple of days. Just the thought of starting high school with a boyfriend made me giddy. I was a girl with a boy who liked her. That fact alone was enough to get me through tonight. My phone buzzed with a WhatsApp message from my aunt in Iran, followed by a picture of flowers. Why did Iranians always message each other bouquets of flowers? 5.05 p.m. from Sarah Mohammadi. Good luck at orientation, Azizam. You're gonna be great. My whole body vibrated with happiness. Everything was coming up, Parveen. So where's this boyfriend of yours? Fabian asked, grabbing a seat next to mine in the auditorium. I scanned the crowd in theater for Wesley, but didn't see him yet. I'd worn my favorite floral t-shirt and Amisara had helped me with a special silver eyeshadow tutorial earlier today. My outfit was perfect for my Wesley reunion. He'll be here. I told Fabian and Ruth everything the second I came home that night from the beach, my lips still tingling. Fabian had kissed plenty of boys and was not impressed. Ruth, however, was in shock that I had somehow landed a kiss at all. Fabian just chuckled, his brown skin more tan since the last time I'd seen him. Remember when you told everyone you had a boyfriend in fifth grade and it turned out he was a cartoon? He was very lifelike, I elbowed him, mussing up his perfectly styled outfit. Fabian put a lot of effort into looking sophisticated, but also liked to pretend he didn't care. Go easy, Fabian, Ruth piped up, her straight black hair and two high buns for her, quote, special occasion hairdo. <laughs> Thank you, Ruth. At least someone was a true friend around here. Let her be delusional if she wants to be. Yeah, I said, sticking my chin out defensively. Wait, Parveen, can you blame us for thinking this guy sounds too good to be true? You do tend to exaggerate, Fabian patted my arm kindly. I never exaggerate, I cried. 
Just then, the lights in the auditorium dimmed and the whole theater fell silent. Welcome, freshman class, a voice called out. Electronic music blasted from the speakers and lights flashed. We watched as a bunch of teachers entered from stage left and began to dance very, very badly. I think I'm gonna have a seizure, Fabian shuddered as her eyes were massacred by the faculty's terrible but enthusiastic dance moves. Then he began streaming it on his phone for posterity. Teachers waved their arms, inviting us to dance with them as Ruth sank lower into her chair. Nobody joined them. Woo! I shouted just because I felt a little bad for the grown-ups who were dancing so hard up there. One of them gave a pained <laughs> smile like she knew how embarrassing this whole thing was. Get it, Fabian shouted, still filming from his phone. The music suddenly stopped and microphone feedback echoed through the auditorium. Generation Z, meet Generation We, a man shouted. He wore a brown suit that looked two sizes too small and had the kind of expression that can only be described as desperate. He stepped into the spotlight, clutching his chest as he tried to catch his breath, his round baby face so red it looked like a cherry. Let's give it up for our amazing teachers. He gestured toward the staff we'd been awkwardly swaying around him. A teacher took a puff of his inhaler. My name's Principal Salk and welcome to James K. Polk High School Freshman Orientation. <laughs> he shouted, spittle flying from the patchy beard he was trying to grow. And here are your student ambassadors who came to share their high school experiences. Principal Salk gestured to a group of students standing on the side of the stage and one of them quickly grabbed the mic. She wore head to toe black and had pale skin and dark purple hair. She looked cool in a terrifying way. <laughs> high school, she whispered into the microphone, is a prison. Becca, Principal Salk shouted, you're not supposed to be here. He chased <laughs> Becca off stage, but not before she bowed to the rest of us. That was amazing, Fabian said it to his phone. He had shared the performance with his followers and I could see comments like, Becca forever. And we love you, Fabian, fill his live stream feed as he pointed the camera at the stage. Being a dancing sensation on Instagram meant Fabian had thousands of fans but I could barely get him to be a fan of believing I had a real flesh and blood boyfriend. <laughs> High school's not actually a prison though, right? Ruth twitched, looking upset despite her sunny yellow K-pop t-shirt. Making high school a prison would be illegal, right? I shrugged. Middle school hadn't been a prison per se, but it hadn't been a walk in the park either. Who knew what high school would be like? My dad had gone to James K. Polk High decades ago, back when he was fresh off the boat from Iran. His advice was 0% helpful. My heart sank as every high school student ambassador following Becca gushed about high school, almost as if to make up for Becca's warning. I got the feeling Principal Salk had chosen a very select social group to speak at orientation, full of good-looking seniors who were thriving. He had completely stacked the deck. Where was the student ambassador who talked about how it was okay to be nervous and sweat too much and accidentally walk into the boys' bathroom like I had before assembly? Because that was the ambassador for me. Ruth was so excited for orientation, she drafted a list of questions and kept squirming in her seat, waiting for some kind of Q&A. She'd even brought her own name tag with custom gold foil that glinted in the auditorium lights while everyone else used the stickers provided by the school. Meanwhile, Fabian ignored all the speakers and answered questions from a zillion social media fans. I don't think he looked up from his phone once. Being a high school freshman can be intimidating for sure, a guy on the football team was now saying, but it's like so much more chill than middle school, you know? No, I wanted to scream, I don't know. So tell me what I don't know. It's like way harder, but also more relaxed. He went on, oh my God, of all the students they could have chosen for orientation, they went with the vaguest person ever. When were we ever going to go over the important stuff? Like when did we have to take the PSATs? And were they optional? Was showering slash being naked in front of my classmates after gym class mandatory? And did the vending machines have hot Cheetos? And where were the vending machines? But most important, <laughs> Where was Wesley? We need to start plotting our next prank, like wrapping all the ketchup, like swapping all the ketchup dispensers in the cafeteria with hot sauce or something equally romantic. I glanced around <laughs> at the auditorium full of 500 kids hoping to find him. James K. Polk was so big, I wished it showed up on Google Maps. Ruth, Fabian, and I got lost just trying to find the auditorium. I honestly wish my parents were here for once they could ask embarrassing questions that were secretly helpful. All of Ruth's questions in her binder were about the arts and crafts closet and whether you could use the industrial sized paper shredder in the front office. Her obsession with crafting was out of control and I hoped she'd keep it together so everyone could assume we were just as cool as the ambassadors on stage, if only for a couple hours at least. And like, there's a new squat rack in the gym, so there's that. Thank you, Kyle, <laughs> Principal Salk started clapping enthusiastically. I didn't think Kyle was actually done speaking, but then again, Kyle was clearly useless. Fabian glued himself from his phone. Do you think he's why our football team is so bad? All right, everyone, we're going to go ahead and break out into tour groups. Outside the auditorium are student ambassadors in blue and red shirts. Please line up next to one. No more than 10 people per group, please. 
Principal Salk shouted before shimming off stage. Finally, I groaned. And I will stop it right there. <laughs> <laughs> that was magnificent. <laughs> I was like, Thanks, guys. Oh, what, I mean, what would you say if you were a high school ambassador? And that's <laughs> I would have. I wouldn't have said high school is a prison. I think I would have been like, just hold on, you'll be out of here in like four years. <laughs> I mean, honestly, that was so similar to my high school orientation experience because they they pick the coolest kids, and like you just you just know like as like an unpopular kid, like when you see a popular person, you just like can tell like the energy rating off of them. So I was like. <laughs> I was just like looking around like at our school being like, is this a joke? Like, this is no. really helpful. They move through the world so differently than me. Like, <laughs> it's so funny. Oh, so that was based on an actual like thing that happened to you. Yeah, I don't know if y'all had this, but like before we end, went from middle school to high school, they like had a little like orientation, right? So you could like, you know, not get lost in the building. And that was when I knew I was doomed. Yeah, seriously, there are times that like, I remember I, I went to like a K-6 school and then it was 7, 12. So I remember going up as a sixth grader to the high school and like no building feels as big as that building felt to me now. Yeah. Like, like it's, it was like a universe. <laughs> but I just, and it's not that big. It's a pretty small school. And all the kids and all the seniors looked like so much older. You're like, they must be in college. You know? yeah. They're older than me now still. <laughs> I mean, technically they are older than me now, but. But like, you know, now you see high schoolers, like seniors in high school, and you're like, I was never that little. Seriously, seriously, <laughs> seriously. Um, well, y'all, I so I went back to my notes. Um, I had the privilege of reading this book in manuscript draft form. When was that, 2017, 2018, 17, 19? A pandemic ago, a child yes. ago. Yes, <laughs> in another life, in another timeline. Um, and so yeah, I had the privilege of reading this and knowing Olivia, like before y'all, I knew her before it was cool. <laughs> and I went back to my notes and I just wanted to read this description that I put in my original consultation. Um, this book is smart and funny and tender and heartbreaking and everything I want in a YA novel, in a novel period. We need more protagonists like Parveen telling their stories, telling their own stories. And like, I just, I've thought, I've laughed about this book for years thinking about it. And like, it just makes me so excited for you and for everyone in the world that this book exists. That's so nice of you. Ah, yeah, for folks who don't know, Kate is um, a freelance <laughs> editor. And I like heard about her on NPR for her book, Bellwether Rhapsody, up there with the yellow spine. And I read it and I loved it because there's also a bassoon in it, which is something Pyrene plays. And I was like, I need, her to make my book good. <laughs> that's it, was good. Right. it was good before. I just came in and was like, poke. <laughs> like, <one thing. laughs> oh, hey, Leanna. Thank you. I did not put her up to that compliment in the chat. <laughs> <laughs> not sponsored. Hashtag not sponsored. Not sponsored content. <laughs> so yeah, so, so you were a bassoon player. I am a bassoon player. Like, what do you think it is about bassoon players and having a sense of humor? I mean, you need to have a sense of humor. If you Google what a bassoon looks like, it is, I mean, you will just laugh. And is it time? luckily for you, I think it is might it time? be time to bust out the bassoon. <laughs> 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 that was like a Star Wars wipe, like the bassoon wipe that they oh. use for some of their fins. <laughs> Wait, I need to have a different expression, like. <laughs> no, I can't, I'm not. Don't ever do that again. That was so <laughs> crazy and effective. So, so yeah, so this is a bassoon. Tarveen plays a bassoon. <laughs> you sit on it. If you can't tell, Kate is sitting on the instrument right now to offset the weight of the <laughs> giant instrument. It's not even in frame. That's how big this thing is. It's like four <laughs> feet, I believe, right? Yeah, Corner yeah, I would say about four feet. And I was I was taller than it when I started playing it. Were you taller than it when you started playing it? Uh, no, I like came up. I want to, or no, I was, but it was like to my jaw or something. Um, mm -hmm. And then in, after middle school, I shot up a little bit. Yeah. And that's the read here. <laughs> <laughs> so that I have a store bought read. Um, pros make their own reads. Just I know. That was, know. that was, that was what separated me from the professionals like for years, for actual years. And I still have them. I am 41 years old. I haven't played the bassoon regularly in a very, very long time. But 
like I, I bought them from my bassoon teacher because they were so good. And I just like I had I had the knives and the tools, but I'm a klutz. And I was like, I don't it's not worth it for me to risk like chopping off my fingers. <laughs> Like, and as you all know from my bio, my bassoon teacher had zero faith in me. So full circle. You full know. circle. Bassoons bring people <laughs> together. I told Olivia that I would play a very short concert in her honor and the publication of Perfectly Parveen because it's such a special moment. My parents are also here. This is going to sound not good, but I'm so thrilled to be doing this <laughs> right now. Hold on. Okay. Is everyone ready? Let's do it. Well, first, first I'll just make a noise on the bassoon. That is generally what it sounds like. <laughs> and actually, I think I can make a... Yeah, it goes low. That's the lowest note. All right. Hit the register. Waiting for the remix, waiting for that beat to drop. <laughs> that was awesome. Thank you so much. You're so welcome. You're so welcome. I, I mean, I do own a bassoon. Like someday in my life, I would like to play again. But I feel like I, I don't even think this bassoon is named yet. You don't have a name? I had a name oh, for the I need to take a screenshot. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> One day, soon, soon. Yes, one day. So, so thank you, an unlikely story, for being the very first like return of Kate Rikulia to playing bassoons and also commemorating how bassoons bring the people together. <laughs> so, so yeah, in Bella the Rhapsody, there's a character who plays bassoon. He's much better at it. He loves it. And yeah, and Olivia just reached out to me and was like, hey, bassoonist, I've written this book. And I was like, oh my god, that sounds really cool. And then I read it, and it's just, like I said, it's everything I want in a book. I laughed. I cried. Um, what was the germ of Parveen for you? Like, where did she come from? Yourself? <laughs> you know, I think, and some some other people have said this too, but um, <laughs> when I was reading YA, it was much, it was a much younger audience and mm. um, the characters weren't necessarily like shy and introverted. And um, I think like after the Twilight stuff, yes. more characters were shy and like, they're older, you know, you've got kids who are like um, graduating high school. Um, and so I really want to like do a throwback to that like era of young adult. And I've had a couple of people be like, yeah, like this is giving me some like, you know, 90s, early Absolutely. nostalgia. Yep. Um, but I, I think the biggest like kick in the pants for Parveen was during the Muslim ban when mm -hmm. um, I had, uh, I live now in Denver, Colorado and um, at Denver National Airport, the day after the Muslim ban was announced, an Iranian family was put in a, uh, put in detention at this uh, airport, despite having a legal visa um, for no reason. Like they had already been approved by the U.S. government to visit, and so they were just being held up for no reason. So um, there was an, a demonstration at the airport. So I drove out there, and um, so many people were there, and it was really touching. And um, a call went out for uh, people who spoke Farsi, like the language of Iran or Persian. And they were like, we need someone like ICE is asking. They don't have like, you know, a translator. And I'm like, wow, like this law is so new. They didn't even like figure out a translator, right? Um, mm -hmm. And uh, I, they were like looking at me and I was like, my Farsi sucks. Like I cannot help this family. And I just felt so ashamed and upset and hurt and frustrated, you know, because I'm half Iranian. Um, that I, on the drive home, I was like, let's interrogate these feelings. And um, mm -hmm. I think that's kind of when Paravian like really uh, got rolling. Um, after that that moment, I was like, let's, yeah, let's, let's, let's do this. Let's take this to the next step, yeah. <laughs> let's tell the story. And that's, I mean, cause the book is so funny. It's so sweet and, it, and it's also so real. Like there's really difficult, hard things that happen in this and it's like, but it leans beautifully into the complexity of everything that Parveen is, right? Like this incredibly challenging moment that is like directly connected to her family and like her teenage experience. Like, it's just, I cried, I laughed, I did all the things. <laughs> it's really, and, and it makes sense too that it was born kind of from that, that feeling within yourself of like, I wanna do something. 
what is my story? How can I tell this story? Totally. How can I, yeah. how can I do this voice? Yeah. Yeah. What does it mean to you to have like written a YA novel with like an Iranian American heroine? Oh my gosh. <laughs> it means so much, not just to have an Iranian American character, but also like uh, on the cover, like that's an Iranian American <laughs> model. Mm -hmm. The art director is Iranian American. Um, and the uh, narrator for the audiobook yeah. is also Iranian American. And so um, it was just, it was really cool because a lot of these Iranian, there are a couple of other Iranian American authors out there who have incredible books, but they're illustrated. Mm. Um, so I think, especially after the administration that we've had, which was like super anti Iranian, 70% of all people affected by the Muslim ban were Iranian Americans. Um, you know, and like the biggest one I believe was at Emerson where you went, where um, mm -hmm. uh, Iranian uh, had a visa to go to school and they shut him down at the airport and he was deported. Um, so yeah, it, it means a lot to me, especially because it's not just a book that has like important themes. It's right. like so timely with the capital T, right? Right, just, right, um, yep. Like a very like, like sad song. Yeah. You know, like, and like kids are looking in the middle distance on the cover. Like it's not like I that. know. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I think a lot of times when a new like, ethnicity is introduced uh, into the category. Um, the biggest books that make splashes have a lot of trauma. And if anything, yes. Carving's, just a, Carving's just a really joyful celebration yes. of a book. So even though there's hard things, like at the end of the day, you will be like cheering for her and smiling. Mm -hmm. So that, that's, yeah. I think, what's most important to me. Yeah, and absolutely. Like when it was done, I read it, I think, in two sittings. And I was like, more, <laughs> more. I require more. And now, <laughs> I mean, it's. It's more. It's, 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 um, I uh, I was gonna say. Oh, uh, Roxanne says, as a French Iranian, it means a lot for mixed Iranian readers. Oh my gosh! Thank you, merci. Uh, um, hold on, my brain is like, oops, yeah. <laughs> Can you talk a little bit about? So it, the germ of her came from that moment, from the feeling of wanting. To, oh, that's what I was gonna say. How did it feel to write the afterward? at the end of the book, talking about the Muslim ban being rescinded. So that was so cool because that happened literally like, you know, in March, um, <laughs> we were, uh, they were like, all right, Olivia, we're like sending this to final copy edits. And I was like, guys, like the Muslim ban was just repealed. Can I add an author's note? Um, and my editor, Stacey Barney, who's incredible, was just like, yeah, sure. Like draft it up. We can, you know, throw it in the acknowledgements if yeah. you want, if there is an extra page. Um, and I was like, okay, great. Like, that sounds good. I didn't expect there to be like its own page and stuff, but then, you know, the team at Penguin like did it real nice. Like um, they made this like gorgeous little page um, full of that, like author's note, just explaining what the Muslim ban was, right? Cause I was mm -hmm. writing in, with something that was in the present tense. And I was like, is this a historical fiction novel? And my editor was like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, like is everything pre-COVID? Yes. I, yeah, I'm like, what is, maybe? I'm like, I could never write a historical novel because I'm terrible at researching, but I was like, maybe I already did write one. You did, you did, <laughs> you totally did. But yeah, I, I definitely, cause like you think of like a 12 year old picking up this book, totally appropriate, totally a 12 year old would love this book. And like, that was, I don't know math anymore, but like they were like seven or eight, right? And like that's already half a lifetime ago to them, you know? Yeah. And I just, it's really, yeah, it's a moment, it's a feeling. Totally, yeah, I'm I'm lucky. It is for ages 12 and up, which is like a little younger than most YA, so it's been really awesome sharing with like my little cousins and stuff. What do they say? <laughs> um, I mean, they don't read books in two sittings. They're not there yet like you, so I'm waiting to get, get the down low on them. If that's what cool aunts say, do they still say down low? Probably they not, I'm sorry. definitely Kevin. say that, right? They definitely <laughs> <laughs> um, so can you talk a little bit about the writing process itself though? So you got the germ, right? And like, how did you, did you just kind of chip away at it for a time? Had you built a writing process? Like, how did you come to the writing of this book? Did you sit down and you're like, I'm going to write? <laughs> yes, that, that's <laughs> literally it. I had written um, some novels before, but because this book is so voice driven, as you can like kind of tell from the yes. excerpt, um, I don't know, I didn't know what it was going to be like until her words were on the page, um, just to see how everything would land and feel. And um, I wrote the first draft in like a six week fever dream. 
<laughs> um, that's like the only way to describe it. Uh, and um, from there, it, it went through like serious revisions. Don't get me wrong, but it, it really was just like, all right, like I've got the idea, like let's do it. Um, mm -hmm. And at the time, I'm you know a freelance filmmaker, so it's like between shoots, I would like um, just pound through this manuscript. And um, what was really nice is I think a big part of the process for me was that I would read like the couple chapters I wrote, um, like the couple days you know, like, let's say like the last two chapters mm -hmm. I wrote, I would start every day and be like, do these jokes land? Is this funny? Mm -hmm. Am I mm -hmm. interested still? And yeah. I would go back and tweak. Yeah. And so that was like how my writing process just like, you know, one step forward, two steps back, just like slowly yeah. chipping away. Um, That's exactly how I do it too. I always, I like yeah. to end knowing where I'm going to start, but I always like read the last few pages to like get into it. And yes, yeah, you need momentum. Mm -hmm. You need, yeah. I, yeah, I, I think you need that momentum. And sometimes when you're drafting, you're like, you know what? I'm going to stop here because I know yep. what happens next. And then I have a good spot to start. Exactly. So I don't just roll up and I'm like, and then they did this. <laughs> sure. Who yeah. knows? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, that's so cool. That's so cool. Um, what was your favorite joke that you cut? And yes, I am asking this question because I know the answer. <laughs> I mean, if you've been to my events before, there is one specific joke <laughs> where Paravin, um, not a spoiler, but in the first couple pages or chapters of the book, Paravine mm -hmm. gets dumped by Wesley, the boy we mentioned in the excerpt. And um, like two days later, oh no, the next, the very next day, she's like scrolling on the gram and she sees that um, he has a new uh, girlfriend and she's like super blonde and blue eyed, just like Wesley and Paravine is just gutted. Um, and she's just like, oh my God, he looks nothing like me. And um, Ruth is like, you know, she's so white they look related and the joke that got cut was when fabian's like they're there lannisters always pay their debts <laughs> and um my editor was like we can't have a game of thrones joke in there she's like first of all i don't watch game of thrones i don't watch any of that foolishness and i was like fair and then she was like that's like you know just <laughs> way too mature so too we, ch we changed fabian changed the joke to don't worry they're definitely going to have a plantation wedding so you know, it, they'll get what's coming to them. Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> um, what was the most fun part to write? Like when you look back on it, do you remember a particular scene or, or like, a, like a particular scene or a particular like development or conversation? Like, what do you remember being super fun? Um, I just want to note that I made Stephen Dunn laugh in the comments, and he's like the funniest person I know. So I'm gonna <laughs> screenshot that for later and hold it close to my heart. Um, the, I, the funniest joke, I actually, I do really like the orientation scene um, yeah. that you just saw, yeah. um, just because a lot of different like characters are in there. But I think my favorite scene is when Paravine um, is like on at her first day of school and her friend Ruth is like, Paravine, you're wearing your shirt inside out. And um, Paravine's like, okay, let me pretend to have a nosebleed. And she's like, I'm gonna run to the bathroom. Um, and while she's in the bathroom, Becca, that scary girl from orientation is like mm -hmm. doing doing something in the bathroom stall. And Paravine's like, oh my gosh, like it sounds like she is unwrapping a massive tampon. And I also <laughs> now use tampons because I'm a mature woman now. She's like really <laughs> proud of herself. And she's like, I will say something because we're high schoolers now. Middle school, we didn't say anything. We just nope. pretended. But nothing no, happened and she's like <laughs> i got this and then she's like oh wait she's vaping <laughs> she's like, in, like putting in a cartridge and then um when becca comes out of the stall paravine's like oh i thought you were trying to vape the tampon <laughs> and, you know it's just one of those moments where her brain is like not keeping up with her mouth so nope, um nope. her brain is like her brain is three jokes three three like yeah. deep into the joke and becca doesn't know what else is happening <laughs> <laughs> totally. And Which I think exactly, that's how, that's how yeah. I am. <laughs> same, same. That's exactly, especially around like 12, 13, I would have this intense interiority that was like all the jokes, all the mystery science theater punchlines, and like only, only like half of one would come out and it would make no sense out of context, but I thought it was cooler. <laughs> right. And I feel like um, in a lot of YA, the interiority comes from uh, the girls being like, ah, oh, I don't know what to do about this boy liking me. I'm going to go on a walk. Oh, I didn't know I had all these missed calls. Plot, because I missed all these calls. And whereas Paravine's just like agonizing about like normal social cues, um, which yep. is like, was like 99% of my brain space, like mm -hmm. growing up for sure. Whereas like, I went to high school with my husband. 
Um, like we, you know, met yeah. after that because we went to a massive high school and he's just like amazed that I like cared so deeply about these things. He's like, I just like went to class. And I'm like, it's a girl thing, I guess. Seriously, but like, <laughs> like, I don't understand what his life is. <laughs> well, do you think, when I think of being that age, and I think when I write about teenagers, the reason I write about teenagers is because I remember it so clearly because my skin was like, not even, I didn't even have skin. It was like, I felt everything, right? And like, it sears these memories into you. But like, um, what do you think it is about writing? What draws you to write about young characters? They're so dynamic. Like yes. you can read, mm -hmm. and the great example I like to give is like, you could read like Hunger Games and Katniss is like, I'm gonna go kill a squirrel. And then it ends with like, <laughs> I just took down a government. And you're like, <laughs> dang. Um, whereas like you read an adult novel and they're like, should I divorce my husband? I don't know, let's I'm see. I'm still not gonna make a and decision, then, but I thought yeah, about it for a long time. Yeah. At the end of the book, they're like, I guess we'll never know. And you're like, what? Just no. Um, and I feel like in adult books, you know, it, the, the character can stay the same, but in a young adult novel, like the character does have to change or have a big like realization. So yeah, yeah. Um, I love that. And yeah, like you, it's like those memories are so vivid. Maybe once again, because I married someone literally yeah. from that time period of my life, so I can never mature. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, You're just maturing together now. It's different. I know. It's different. Yeah. Um, I, and I think, yeah, there's just, that was when my emotions were at their highest. And if being an author is empathizing, well then, <laughs> man, like that's like my rich well of like empathy and sympathy that I was I'm yes. constantly pulling from. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I always, I mean, I don't have any, I don't have any kids and I don't have any friends. Oh, no, that's not true. I have a friend who has a 13 year old, but like most of my closest friends are kids or younger. But I'm like, I feel so warmly towards teenagers and I can't tell if it's because I don't necessarily have any actual teenagers in my daily life <laughs> or like if it's just like, I would always be like teenagers. I feel you, I see you. I would, it would make you die of embarrassment if I just gave you a hug, but that is what I want to do metaphorically. <laughs> <All the time. laughs> totally, it's just, it's the worst and the best time. Yeah, it is, it's true. Um, to my other question, back to my previous question about what was the most fun scene to write, what was the hardest scene to write? Uh, or the scene um, you struggled with the most or kind of like had to crack open? Yeah, so the scene I struggled with the most and that my editor was just like, Olivia, like you gotta dig in here more. Um, <laughs> there is a character in the book named Amir. He's uh, Parveen's Farsi buddy. Um, doing you know, she, she's doing the swoony shoulders. Um, <laughs> and in the book, Parveen, uh, in the original draft, Parveen um, is like really struggling. She, he's cute, he's funny, he's smart, <laughs> um, and they have great chemistry in Farsi class because she's, she didn't think he'd ever like her. Um, so, you know, it's like the ones you least expect. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, Parveen um, is just like, he doesn't give me butterflies. Like, um, even if he likes me, like, I don't know if I can take him to homecoming. Like, I don't think he'll make Wesley jealous. My editor is like, why won't he make Wesley jealous? Why does she not like him? And it took me a really long time um, to realize that like, like myself, Paravine has internalized racism mm -hmm. to people who look like her. Mm -hmm. Paravine has a white mom. And this is like we said, the most awkward time of your life. You're growing, your body's changing. And her mom um, can't really help her not okay. only understand her body, but but celebrate it too. And be like, you know, this is how we make our hair look great. Or like, oh, this color looks awesome on our skin tone. Um, so Parveen's kind of lost there and Amir looks like her. And what if, if she takes a boy um, to homecoming who has all of these features that she's already insecure about, like will Wesley like be jealous or um, can she, if she likes Amir, then like what does that say about all the things that she thought was like beautiful? Like does that mean that like being blonde haired, blue eyed like isn't like, you yep. know, beautiful? And like it makes her question all these Eurocentric beauty standards that she has um and that's something that i i mean to this day i struggle with yeah. even now for this like thing i was like i need to straighten my hair so i look nice and i'm like wait i wait. wrote a book about this like it's wait, it's wait. so hard it's in the water and I, and I think of like she looks at you know movies and media to see how she should behave right and she eventually she realizes that like the behavior of these women but it's a deeper more insidious kind of like toxic racism that she is just ingested i can totally oh my gosh. Yeah. no totally yeah. even like for we the, all cover, have ingested. the, yeah. <laughs> the <laughs> model um like just the model like sample photos before mm -hmm. she like put this gig when you're just like choosing um i think she had like contoured her nose to look 
like more like European. And like, I was like, guys, like we gotta make sure like her note, we, we see her normal nose. Mm-hmm. And like, um, you know, that was something that like we, we made happen. Like sure enough, you can see her like awesome, like Iranian nose. Um, yep. She's also just like gorgeous in general. She could yes. literally be wearing a trash bag and give it a <laughs> It'd be like glowing, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but like that was, yeah, it's it's still a struggle mm-hmm. with me today. And that's, that's why, it was so hard for me because um, I had that scene had to teach me a lot. Like mm-hmm. that scene taught me um, those characters knew more than I did at the time. Mm-hmm. And I was just, you know, trying to catch up to the knowledge that they were trying to impart to me. And now um, as a mom, the mother of a daughter, yeah. um, it's, it, I think all of these things kind of came together for me to like nail that feeling. And it's a gross, ugly, icky feeling that you never want to acknowledge, but I had to for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And it is like, it's, it's a human, it's a very human feeling, right? Like we can't, yeah. And, and it's just so good to lean into. I see people giving you, um, thank you for speaking about this. And I struggle with that too, says Ryan. Yep. It's so hard, Ryan, I feel you. I, I think now, okay, for example, I saw um, like Shang-Chi Legend of 10 Rings or whatever, like yeah, the yeah. trailer for Marvel. I swear yeah. this is related, but apparently <laughs> a lot of people were like, um, oh my God, he's so ugly. Like, how could he be like cast mm-hmm. as a superhero? And I'm like, first of all, Simi Liu is like very fine. <laughs> um, <laughs> but it's also like the reason you don't think that's attractive is because you've never seen someone in a movie like this get mm-hmm. to be attractive. Yeah. Um, and so I, I think it's just very timely right now, just you know, showing Absolutely. different people and all their beauty. Yeah. And and yeah, and and the and understanding or or showing how these standards are arbitrary. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely <laughs> like, arbitrary. Arbitrary and culturally reinforced. And yeah, yeah, it's really, that's incredible. And like, I just, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I actually, I wanted to say um, like the, there were two things in the um, acknowledgements that really just like, um, that your dad helped you. So there's a lot of poetry in Farsi and that your dad helped you with a particular poem in the book, like that feelings. How is that working? How, I mean, how is it to have your parents read this? <laughs> um, I actually don't think my parents have read the book. My dad's more of an audiobook guy, so he's excited for that. Yeah. Um, yep. And he helped a lot also, I should say, for with the pronunciation of things in the audiobook and doing the poem. So um, the the woman doing the audiobook is like this like amazing actress who has like her own HBO special and she like writes on every TV show I love. So and like I'm like be cool, Dad, don't embarrass me. <laughs> and how did um, you connect with her? I feel like this is also a good story. Oh, um, I just reached out on Instagram and I was like, Hey, I know this is weird, but I really like your work and I just really want an Iranian American to narrate my audiobook and what you narrate and she instantly wrote back and was like yes and penguin random house once again to their credit was like awesome let's do it and she has like three agents you know they're like oh. working all together yeah. um yeah. and i didn't i didn't even know it was happening until she like sends like me a photo or like tell it tells me like tomorrow i'll be in the audio booth for your book and i'm just like um but like I, every every time i think social media is the worst i'm like no it actually means you can occasionally reach out and like where is he back in yeah, like make these connections that are like meaningful and genuine and lead to amazing things. <laughs> it's amazing. I yeah, I just I, my my parents helped me a lot. I'm I'm super grateful. Um, I, my Farsi is terrible, so <laughs> I needed all the help I could get. <laughs> <laughs> um, and the dedication, which I will read the dedication, which is so beautiful. For all the daughters who look nothing like their mothers, and then at the end, I won't read it because it's. It's very beautiful. But what you say to your daughter, who is how old now? Uh, she's okay. eight months. Yeah. Like, <laughs> imagine her reading this book in like 12 years. Like, what does that feel like? So, <laughs> yeah, I grew up with a white mom, a mom from Argentina, and um, I look nothing like her. And uh, <laughs> when I gave birth, uh, life comes at you fast, y'all, because that kid looks nothing like me. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I was like, I, I wrote that dedication before she was born, but I'm like, I guess this one's for you, kid. <laughs> <laughs> but it is like, I mean, just imagining, yeah, like, it's your mom who wrote this book, which will at that time <laughs> will be like historical fiction, so. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. <laughs> 
Um, if you could go back to yourself, you, Olivia, at Harbin's age, what would you say to her? This is oh the Barbara gosh. Walters portion of the interview. <laughs> what do you know? Um, yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, everything, I, I, it's really this book is for 14 year old Olivia. Um, oh, here's my kid. Do you want to see her real quick? Yes. Um, I would tell myself that, you know, you're perfect the way you are, which is kind of the the moral of this novel. I mean, look at this. Hi. Look at these blue eyes. Like, I can't make this up. <laughs> Do we look related? I'm going to get carded when I try to pick you up from kindergarten. Like, this is nuts. <laughs> People think I'm the nanny. <laughs> oh my God. What do you think, kiddo? Yeah. All right. It's, Back to Dad. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> so I the bassoon and the baby cameos, fantastic. <laughs> bassoon, babies, books, beats, Battlestar Galactica. Galactica. <laughs> I could listen to you guys talk for hours. This has been fantastic. Um, let's take a couple audience questions. There's some good ones. All right. This one is from Rumi. This has YA film or TV adaption written all over it. If you could choose, who would your dream cast be? Oh my gosh. Um, so because she's Iranian American, they're like, actually I'd need to cast an unknown. Um, mm -hmm. Although I, I do have a couple like side characters I'd love to cast um, uh, for, uh, the cool aunt, I would love for it to be Mitra Juhari who did the audiobook. <laughs> um, and there's, uh, and for the father, there's a comedian named um, Maz Jobrani who's so funny. I think he'd be a great dad. Um, and for Hannah, um, big dad energy, big dad energy. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yep. Yep. BDE for sure. <laughs> um, and Hannah, uh, who's like Parveen's buddy in Farsi class, I would love to be played by Yara Shahidi. Who is on Grownish and Blackish? Um, she's just so cool. But I, for Paravin, the only contemporary like uh, like girl who is like in that wheelhouse is um, an actress named Geraldine Vishwanathan. I'm messing up her name. I'm sorry, but she's in a movie called Blockers, and she's just so funny and so good. Um, but there isn't any Ryan American equivalent, so um, just you know, you have to search. <laughs> yeah, have to do a search. <laughs> this next one is from Charles. What Iranian stories made you feel safe as a child? Oh my gosh. Um, ooh, I have one here. <laughs> Look what I just bought. I got this gorgeous Shah Nameh. This is the Persian Book of Kings. That's like what I grew up with. Oh. Um, and so this is by Ferdowsi. It's like an epic uh, tale, if you will. And I got like the illuminated version with all of these gorgeous, um, like illustrations, it looks like, like an illuminated text. Yeah, it's, I mean, it was worth a pretty penny, but this was my like, you know, debut gift to myself. Um, yep. But that I thought was really fun. Um, another book, this one actually came out recently, so maybe not as in, from childhood, but it's called Darius the Great is Not Okay. I've got it on my shelf right here by Adib Haram, and that's also about half Iranian. Um, American kid trying to find his place in the world, but he travels to Iran in the book, which is so fun because I've never been to Iran and I could like kind of like get a taste for what the country would be like. So I really recommend that book if you like Paravine and you want to learn more about Iranian American culture for sure. This one is from Roxanne. Are you thinking about a sequel for Parveen or another YA book with Iranian representation? So I can't say the title yet, but I am happy to say that there is another book in the Paravine verse, as people are calling it now. Yes! Not, I did not coin that phrase. Um, uh, a, a certain someone from Paravine's Farsi class is the protagonist to um, the next book, and it follows her at, on her journey of wanting to become a songwriter. But like me, she has something called vocal nodules. So growing up, I had like really bad um, vocal issues with my vocal folds and. Um, they were called chords back then. Now they're called vocal yeah. folds, I guess. Um, and I had a lot of trouble speaking. I'd go to speech therapy for it and, um, you know, have a lot of like work done on my esophagus. So it's about a girl who wants to sing but medically can't and the people she needs to team up with to make her battle of the band dreams come true. So more band. <laughs> oh my gosh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> 
I did choir as a kid in high school and like the, all the band scenes, I just, I felt those. Like to the <laughs> floor. I was like, oh God, it's too relatable. <laughs> Seriously. This one is from Ryan. What K-pop groups or K-dramas would Paravine love? Oh my gosh. Great question. I mean, BTS, OBS. I'm so old, y'all. I was like, um, <laughs> like 21 era K-pop. <laughs> Just like it makes me agent. Um, but yeah, I think she'd be just a huge BTS fan. And I think she would love um there's like this one about some I forget the name of it. It's about this like woman who has a paragliding accident and ends up in North Korea. <laughs> um and she falls in love with a North Korean uh, military officer. It's so good. Uh Crash Landing on You, it's on Netflix. Um <laughs> I think she would like that one a lot because it's just so ridiculous. <laughs> and we have one more question. Were there any anyone in your life that influenced your characters? Man, I mean everyone. I'm sorry if you're recognized in the making of this <laughs> like I'm trying to change it. Like um, I think uh, Paravine's friends, Ruth and Fabian, are just a culmination of like all the friends I've had growing up, but like the best parts for sure. Um, and her dad, uh, is definitely a lot like based a lot on my dad, um, and his heart to hearts. And I've had other Iran American friends be like, my Baba is the exact same way. And I was like, yes. Um, and yeah, I think, uh, the band scenes are just a direct ripoff of like my own experiences. And, um, there is a character in the book named Maddie Fumero, who's like kind of her, um, like the heartthrob of sophomore year. And he was really an amalgamation of like all the cool theater boys um, mm -hmm. growing up. Mm -hmm. And like, um, like you know, my husband said that like he wasn't internalizing like anything the same way in high school. And like, <laughs> it's clear that Maddie isn't either. He's just like, no, that's like so cool. Like, ah, these emotions are so raw. Like, Harvey, and, like, you know, like, how are you doing? And he's just like, um, so earnest. It's like kind of hard to read sometimes. And um, because Paravine's just so conniving. So, it's an interesting uh, contrast for sure. <laughs> <laughs> She's like, there's gotta be like a layer underneath that, right? And he's like, no. But <laughs> you think it's turtles all the way down, but there's nothing under that turtle. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> well, this I, have, I have one more question. If sure. One more question. Absolutely. What are, you, what are you reading, watching slash listening to right now in these pandemic times? <laughs> I am so glad you asked. I am currently reading Off the Record by Cameron Garrett. Um, it's so, so good. She, I believe, has a background in journalism, even though she's like 20 years old. She's so talented. Um, so it was cool to read a YA book following a character like trying to get quotes, writing articles, doing profiles on people um, as they tour the world. Um, right now I'm watching Girls 5 Eva on TikTok. Oh. <laughs> which is just, I haven't, honestly, this week has just been so much and I forgot to eat a vegetable for like three days and I <laughs> woke up today feeling like I'd been hit by a truck and I was like, I need to open a box of vegetable soup and sit in front of the TV and just veg out. So Literally, that's what I've been watching. Uh, yeah. Veg out. I saw what you did. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then listening to, um, it's summer now, so I feel like I'm, listening to some like bots, you know, um, I, some Taylor Swift was mentioned in the green room yep. before we came on the song, cruel summer, which is also written mm -hmm. by Kane Vincent. It's mm -hmm. just so well-written. And I'm, um, on, on this other book I'm working on, I'm just trying to listen to a lot of songs with incredible lyrics. So, um, that's definitely one of them. Uh, and yeah, I think that's going to be my jam for post course, post quarantines. It's a perfect jam. It's a perfect mood. <laughs> perfect jam is perfect. <laughs> Thank you both so much. Oh my gosh. Kate, I couldn't think of a more perfect moderator for this event. Oh, thank, you. <laughs> thank you for pulling up for this soon. That was amazing. I can and Olivia, your Game of Thrones joke. I literally choked on my teeth. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Like, and thank you for saying that because my editor was like on one of these other like virtual events and I like said the joke out loud and then she could see all the comments with the people like <laughs> being like, oh my God, OMG, LOL. And she's like, all right, we'll find a way to work it in. <laughs> 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 oh, 
they're not supposed to watch it, but they watch it. <laughs> <laughs> Click that green button to order your copy of Perfectly Parveen. Um, if you need a laugh or if you've ever been called loud or you just want a fun read in the relatable read, pick this up. Teens, adults, absolutely. Pick this book up. It's so fun. Such a delightful read. I went to take Thank a screen you, Olivia. <laughs> congratulations on your debut book. And oh my God, your baby is so cute. <laughs> thank you all so much. And thank you everyone for um, being on this live. It means so much to me. It's it's weird debuting um, during a pandemic, but just seeing all the comments here and um, seeing some friendly faces in the comments has just made this so much easier and so, so wonderful and special to me. So thank you all so much. And Unlikely Story as well. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Olivia. Thank you, Kate. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Congratulations, Olivia. <laughs>